Welcome back, everyone. This is the Flow Track Podcast. Happy Monday. I'm Kevin Sully. He's Gordon Mack. Wherever you are tuning in, I hope your week is off to a great start. And I think I just have a guess. I have a suspicion, Gordon. We have a lot of Jamaican listeners tuning in live on the YouTube chat today. Love it. It's great. Welcome. Uh, you've been here before. You're staying with us. And I'm excited to talk about what we just saw on Saturday. I had a great weekend. It was a great meet, first of all. That meet from top to bottom, obviously the, the star event was that women's 100. But beyond that, there were so many great performances on the distance side, the throw side, everything. So we'll dive all into it. But obviously, the, uh, the race that we all cared about, the one that we all tuned in to watch that was hyped up beyond, beyond belief was that women's mm-hmm. 100. And I personally feel like I wanted multiple results to happen. Like I wanted, I just wanted thing. I just wanted uh, drama, not drama, but like I wanted after the race to happen, something to be like, oh shit, here we go again. Like this is going to, it's not going to stop here. Like this isn't the end. And I felt like that result was something was, I want to see it again. I want to see them go up against each other in 2022. And now both sides have uh, incredible, like, not shit talk, but, like, you couldn't ask for a better, like, what moment. I mean, I don't think anyone saw Shikari getting dead last. Even the people who hate Shikari did not predict her to finish dead last, which makes it even more exciting. But we'll dive into it first. But first, before we talk about Shikari, we should talk about Elaine Thompson. Yeah. I, 10.54. 10.54. Is no joke. That doesn't grow on trees. That is a re- like ten sixty one. We 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 started getting used to seeing ten six ten sixes because you know Shelly Ann ran that in the regular season, and we kind of just felt like we started normalizing ten six. And then when we saw the ten sixty one Olympic final, it was great, but it kind of felt a little normal because we had seen a ten point six on the clock in twenty twenty one multiple times, but ten fifty four. Flojo, watch out. I mean, some people would argue it could be even that the actual real world record because people controversy on Flojo's time, whether it was wind dated or not. But 1054, Elaine Thompson, only plus 0.9 win. Yeah. I don't know about you, but like put this on top of what she's done the past two Olympics with winning gold in 100 and 216 and in 2021. It makes her her one year. What year was it that she didn't run? Was it 2019 or 17 where she kind of had a, a bad championship performance? Well, 19, she she struggled. It's, it's most – well, it's been the, – the Olympics has been where she's really shined in the yeah. 2015 World, World Championships. Um, she ran well in that 200 with, with Daphne Shippers. But yeah, this is, but, this is remarkable. Like yes. this was supposed to be one of those world records – that was not touched. This was supposed to be an off-limits world record. This one, the 200, the women's four. There's a couple other ones out there as well. But this was not supposed to be one that we were going to talk about in the current era. 10-7 low was impressive enough. And then we get into this year, and you're right. Shelly Ann goes 10-63. Elaine runs 10-61 in Tokyo, pointing at the clock. And you're thinking, man, all right, maybe she could go faster. But... It's the Olympic final. She's got to be amped up for that one. Now it's a couple weeks later at pre. She can't possibly do it again, and she does it even better. 10.54, world record is in play. And I'm one of those people who obsessed over the 10.49, Gordon. I wrote a whole oral history. People go find it about was it windy, was it not windy. Point is, this is a record, and it's 10.49, and people thought it would never be touched, and now she's .05 from it. It is just incredible to think that she has this now in her sights. Same thing with that 200 mark as well. She didn't get to run it at pre, but geez, if she did, who knows how fast she would have run in a a 200, given what sort of form she's in. She has the opportunity. It's obvious now. We said it before. Hey, if she goes to the Olympics again in 2024, gets two more gold medals, where does she stack up in history? It's obvious now where she's going to stack up in history. It's going to be at the top if she does it again, if she continues to clip these times. Because the one thing, because that those women's records were out there, it was always tough to compare 
Bolt to Shelly Ann because Bolt had the records. Shelly Ann didn't. But now if Elaine Thompson's going to go get the records and get the golds, my God. Like, I, I can't believe – everybody wanted to talk about all the other stuff that went on in this race, and we'll talk about it in a second. There was plenty of other stuff to talk about. But let's not it obscure from the fact that she ran 10.54. 10.54. I thought it was going to be windy. I saw the time. I said, oh, let, me, let me check the wind. Let me double, triple check the wind. 0.9? Not 2.9. Not 3.9. 0.9. And she did it, you know, coming off the emotional high of the Olympics, coming like dealing with the travel, it being a one-off race. This is a this is the first race back from the Olympics. Yeah. I expected most of the results on the sprint side to be slower because I thought this was going to be like getting your feet wet to get your feet ready for the rest of the Diamond League season. You know, maybe it's not going to be until the Diamond League final in September where we see fast marks again in the sprints. I thought this was kind of be yeah. rust buster, but, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves, seeing what Noah Lyles did in his 200 and now seeing what Elaine did here. It's, you know, it, I was shocked. I did not expect fast yeah. at this race. I expected fast in September. I expect fast in, in the Olympics, and I expected fast in September. I did not expect it in August, so I was shocked. I know I had a whole bit about, oh, the race is going to be slow, I mean, the main reason I thought the race was going to be slow is I just thought like, hey, they're coming off of the Olympic high. They're they're going, they're traveling, they're dealing with this. You saw a lot of people were dealing with like long travel days to get to Eugene in the first yeah. place. I thought all that mm -hmm. and just like the amount of pressure on the event was just going to kind of deflate and turn into just kind of like a, all right. But it didn't. It didn't deflate. It kind of exploded. And Elaine Thompson is a big reason for that. You know it's good. Put up this yeah. graphic that we have on the screen right now. Whenever you have five different acronyms next to your mark, you know you did a good thing, right? <laughs> World lead, national record, diamond league record, meet record, PB. It's pretty pretty <laughs> damn good for Elaine Thompson. -Hurley. Yeah, and I thought I thought Fraser Price would run about ten seven, and I thought she'd win. I thought Fraser Price's ten seventy three would be enough to win because I looked at. The Tokyo performance from Elaine Thompson as an all timer and one that would be tough to replicate again in her career. Lil, than I know, she was just getting started and she has that little boot. It almost looks like a little boost that last 50 meters. She's like with everybody and then just, I know she's not because I know she's, she's slowing down later because that's how sprinting works after you hit the top speed. But she was, she was with people like for 50 meters and then just completely gone the second half of the race it was just it was textbook it didn't look like as big as a blowout as as tokyo maybe because she wasn't celebrating across the line but elaine thompson hurrah i mean i'm sure i'd be interested to know what the jamaican fans think like what does she need to do to surpass bolt because i think that's a conversation that we can start to have here especially she goes to 2024 if she does the one and two again she's equal bolt with the the triple doubles, as we mentioned, the triple at three Olympics, shouldn't have the world championship success in between. And if she's also able to get the world records, now I know people would say, well, Bolt put those world records into another stratosphere, to which I would argue Elaine Thompson's been chasing world records that were already in another stratosphere. So the mere fact that she catches up to them is impressive enough. So it's going to be hard for her to catch up with the total medal haul because she's behind in the world championships. But if she goes uh, 16... Tokyo 20 slash 2021, and then 2024, one, two, four by one at all three, and gets the world record in both. My gosh, you got you got to, you have to compare that mark to, or that that record to to both. Yeah, it just makes her 2019 and 2017 like finishes like super surprising, right? You're like, wait, how can you be on the verge of breaking a uh, once unbreakable world record? Flojos, yeah. and then you at the same time you're finishing like fifth or fourth at world championships between your two mm -hmm. double doubles. It's just yeah. like yeah, it's wild. Well, she's got to keep it up. Hey, she's yeah, got to keep, keep it up. up. That's I mean, the thing. Like, and, and, and there's no guarantee, and there's no guarantee that she's going to run faster. But I just got healthy. done saying it's always 10, a thing. Yeah, I I just got done saying 1061. Like I'm pretty confident that at least be her season best. Maybe not her PR, but at least be her season best. And then a couple weeks after the Olympics. 
she goes and and outdoes herself. So I'm not putting any limits anymore on what Elaine Thompson hurrah can do. Because as I mentioned, Fraser Price, Shrika Jackson ran great races. Ran great races and were two tenths behind. Yeah. It's it's wild too how the result was literally the podium order. How often do we see kind of f- weird results where you know we saw a manual career in the eight hundred Olympic champion get third in his race, right? We see random times where Olympic champions or silver medalists don't finish where they should have based off how they did at the Olympics. Here we had the exact order of the podium: first, second, third. Finished first, second, third in this race. Now, obviously. We had a little bit of difference uh, beyond the first, second, third. Tiana Daniels ran well. She finished fourth. We'll talk about more to, uh, on Wednesday about her and kind of talk about what Tiana Daniels is in the women's 100, but we want to spend more time on that on Wednesday. So Tiana Daniels fans out there, we're going we're gonna to go deep, deep dive on Tiana Daniels on Wednesday's pod. But then we got to talk about the elephant in the room. Well, it was the elephant that everyone was waiting to see perform, right? It was the circus act that we were all waiting to see what would happen. Shakari Richardson. I went on record thinking that she was going to come out here and win a race. I thought it was, she would win it in a slower time, but I didn't expect her to run an actual extremely slow time and finish dead last. And what did she even run? She 11, 11, 14. 11, 1. Yeah. Who, I mean, outside the people who thought, Jamaica was going to destroy Shikari. I don't think even those people thought she would run 11-14, right? So no. I think – I'm trying to figure out why this happened, right? Not, it's not an excuse, but I just want to be like, why? We – I think worst-case scenario, we thought she maybe finished fourth in this race, right? You know, she's the USA champ. She clearly – maybe she doesn't have the pedigree as the top three Jamaicans, but you run 10-7, you should be able to finish in the top half of this field. So I think it's one of two things. It's one of three things, but I think it's actually two of three. And I think one, so there's three reasons. One, injury, which I don't think is true. She doesn't look injured. She looks completely healthy. So throw that out. She's fine. Two, she choked. There's like, she just couldn't handle the situation that she built up all the time off. And she just straight up choked against the elite competition. And three, she just wasn't as prepared. She wasn't as fit. Maybe her training since getting banned during that month off, you're not sure what she was doing day to day. Maybe, you know, we saw a lot of, she was in a bunch of promotional stuff. Maybe her training wasn't as tuned as it would have been if she was not banned and, you know, going through the regular motions. I think it's a combination of lack of um, prep, preparation, and I think also a, a little bit of choke. I think she choked a little bit. So I think it's a little bit of a combination of those two. And that's why she finished dead last in this heat. Because Shakari Richardson should not be finishing dead last in this heat. If you're a 10-7 woman who's running multiple times, you're a U.S. champion, you should not be finishing yeah. dead last. Clearly something happened. Now I'm willing to admit, even the best version of Shakari would, bro- would not have beaten Elaine Thompson, right? We're now talking about Elaine Thompson in historical yeah. greatest of all time realm. But I think the best of Shakari should have at least finished second, third, or fourth, fourth. or fifth. Fourth, fourth you fourth, know. Yeah. Yeah. Fifth at worst, not ninth. So I'm shocked that this happened. I don't know what it was, right. but what do, you, what do you think the I mean, reason is that be- she wasn't able to run at least 10-7 and be up there with the with the three Jamaicans? Well, I, I agree with you in that Thompson hurrah was was going to win this race. It's the second fastest time in history. I don't think anything can prepare you to have a 10-5 on one side of you and a 10-7 low on the other side of you. That puts you under pressure immediately. And if you get off to a bad start or anything less than perfect, it's going to be tough to recover from because you're going to feel like you're out of the race. I think part of it was probably the five next to you in a race because there's only one other person who's run that fast in, in history. So again, she could have run great and it still would have been a similar result. I think she would have been out of the elite, you know, out of, she would out of one, but th- there's a scenario too, where she runs a really good time coming off of a two week break runs 1080 and gets fourth. And then people are still going to be saying, Oh, wow, you lost, you had a terrible race. But 
I'm interested to see like if she runs more this year, what that looks like. Um, obviously not counting her out long term here, but this was uh, we knew we'd get some sort of surprise here. Remember when Serenity was talking last week? Someone's gonna fall star. There's gonna be some sort of injury. I guess the weird thing was the weird thing that did happen was Richardson got last. So Richardson gets last, kind of has big egg on her face, right moment. Not only did she get last, but the people that beat her had an all-time race. After all this buildup, <laughs> literally like 20 seconds after crossing the finish line, she does a live interview on NBC. And there's the, she just goes right into as if it was pre-race. Like it was almost as if the race hadn't happened yet. Like if you watch this interview, you would have no idea that she just got smoked and finished dead last. She went right into the, I'm the best. I'm, you know, you haven't seen the last of me. She said, yeah. you can talk all your shit. She said that on national TV, which is great. I'm sure NBC was like, oh, oh, what are we going to do? Moms yeah. around the country are going to be calling. Say, she said shit. Um, yeah. And I was shocked seeing that interview. I did not, I thought she'd be like, a little bit of like, damn, like, you know, a little, little bit of like a humbleness, like a little bit of like, oh man, like, like laughing at herself type feeling. Like you think when you get beat like that, you maybe, you maybe want to kind of be on, yeah, laugh at yourself. I mean, man, I, I suck today, right? I'm sure all the other athletes are like, man, I really put up a stinker. But she pretended as if she didn't lose. She's just like, no, this race didn't count. I, I, you know, she carries unique, Wait. right? She's really big on this whole, like, talking shit, and it, I like it. And I think the people like it because they all wanted to watch her run. If she doesn't talk like that, people aren't going to watch the race. Non-traditional track fans are out there excited to see this race. She did worlds for the popularity of this event, and people are still going to want to watch her going forward. But we had yet to see she carry in this situation – where she's kind of like on the wrong side of, not history, but the wrong side of the result, right? She was finishing dead last. And I was surprised that she kind of took it to, uh, I thought she would have a little bit of humbleness, but no, she went she went ham on saying like, talk all your shit. So yeah, maybe I if I was after- her advisor, I would be like, hey, maybe one one interview every 10, you can be like a little humble, but hey, She's her own woman. She can do what she wants. And uh, she decided to choose this path, the path of most resistance, most likely, because now everyone is going to be going crazy. Didn't you say before the the meet happened, if she lost, you know, maybe she'd speak about these things differently? And I said, no, like she is who she is. <laughs> this is and especially she, she is who she is. You're right. 10 seconds after the race, 20 seconds after the race, when someone puts a microphone in her face, She's not going to change who she is. She did. I saw later an interview in the mix zone where she did apologize for it and said that she, you know, she shouldn't have um, used that sort of language. Here's the thing I don't understand though. And I think Michael Johnson touched on it in a, in a string of tweets as well too. Did Shelly and Fraser Price or Elaine Thompson hurrah ever say anything to her? It seems as if, and the Michael Johnson tweet that I'm referring to, he says, here's why I know success about success of the sport. No matter how talented, it takes a high level of focus. All your focus, people talking SHIT, and a chip on your shoulder are a distraction from focus. Now, some people get motivated by that, right? So I, I don't know 100% if that's accurate. Now, it's Johnson, obviously, you can't dispute his, his record of success. But when someone doesn't run well, then you're going to go back and you're looking, you're saying, hey, is this too much about a chip on your shoulder? Because the reason I bring up Fraser Price and Thompson are off they weren't really saying anything to her. So all of this was just sort of this, she's in this perpetual cycle of conflict with people, but the people aren't her competitors. The people aren't even really the media because the media by and large are interested in what she's saying, interested in what she's doing, very captivated by who she is. Some in the media probably criticized her for the marijuana ban, although some of them completely took her side. But it seems like the conflict that she's in is just with people on the internet. Because when she says in that post-race interview, keep talking shit, she's not talking about a competitor. She's talking about people on the internet. And you can go on the internet in 2021, and this is why 
I have a lot of sympathy for professional athletes right now. You can find somebody who says you're the greatest, but then you can also find 10 people who say you're terrible even if you win a gold medal, let alone if you finish last. So long term, I don't know how sustainable this is, back to Michael Johnson's point. It seems like she's fueled by it, but I also could see the negative side to it where you're never really going to please everybody. And the fact that her competitors aren't really saying anything. Now, Shelly Ann like, had the meme afterwards with the eye, eyes and stuff. But there's no end to this is what I'm saying. <laughs> right? You can always find somebody who says, doesn't matter if you're N- NFL, NBA, boxer, MMA, track, tennis, doesn't matter. You can go on the internet and find people to, to tell you that you aren't good, even though you're one of the best in the world. Like this doesn't this doesn't end anywhere, which is what would what would concern me. Yeah, I mean, people think Michael Jordan sucks. People think LeBron James sucks. People think Tom Brady suck. It's sports, right? You're, you're, no one is a hundred percent universally loved. And I agree with you. I think she, here's the thing, though. I think she's going to be able to look at this race as a one off because right now it is the yeah. only race she's done, and so she can yeah. kind of not connect her love of digging into the people on the internet as a reason for her bad performance because it's just one race. It's going to take multiple races to happen for her to, or people around her to be like, Hey, maybe it's that, that maybe that's the reason these, these races aren't going too well for you is because you're distracted. But right now she doesn't have enough data points to justify changing anything right she has one bad race people have bad races all the time so she can be like chalk it up as wasn't my day we'll see let's move on to the next so wait but here, at the, but here's like, yeah we also ahead. kind of sound Sorry. like old people being like get off the internet like you know people criticize no, saying, kevin durant no, no, no. for like being all in on twitter but he's one of the greatest of all time and he's he's still able to perform so yeah no i'm not saying get off the internet i'm just saying i have sympathy for athletes who are who want to be on the internet like any other person and want to know what's going on and just have a million people coming at them from different directions. I just want to go back to what we said before the race, which was how Richardson is unique. And the reason why there's so many people watching live right now and waiting to hear people comment is because she put stakes on something that did not have stakes. And most people in track, they are trying to, push pressure off of their shoulder. They're trying to lower expectations and you're not so animated if it was somebody who for the last two months, all they had said was, I'm just focused on my training. I'm just trying to execute Gordon. I'm just trying to go out there, put my best race out there. I don't have any time goals. I'm just trying to stay in my lane, my race, you know, trot out every single cliche. Like they're not interested in that. People are interested in that. People are interested in what she's doing. And that comes with the good and that comes with the bad. And back to Michael Johnson's point about you know, the mental health within, within sports right now, I, I, I hope for her sake that like, this is something that's, that's positive for her and helps get her going. Because once you get into this cycle, it doesn't seem like it ever ends because you can always find people there who are going to hate on your performance. Even if you went, like, even if you, even if she ran the 1054, there'd be people out there talking. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what happens. I think this is a story that we've only kind of seen the first two chapters Right, we saw chapter one, which was like her rise to being an elite sprinter, dominating the U.S. circuit, and uh, chapter two is uh, the first big failure of hers. I mean, she's had other failures, right? You talked about 2019; she finished dead last in the U.S. hundred. So, this isn't the first time she's had a bad race, but this is the first time she's had a bad race where people on both sides of the aisle were expecting one was expecting her to have a great race. The others were expecting her to have a, you know, wanting wanting her to lose. So there was no one was really watching the women's hundred meter twenty nineteen championship, right? No one was watching. I mean, people were watching it, but like the amount of people watching that race versus this race, night and day, it's like a hundredfold. So yeah, um, yeah, I I picked her to win, and she didn't. I probably. I had, I've, I've had like a weird like cycle of my thoughts on Shikari and what I thought she could be 
in the sport. When she would, her freshman year, I was like, I was like, I was on the Shikari train. And then as soon as I saw her at pre and USA's not do well, I was like, she may be a flash in the pan, which happens. And that's great. Some people have one-off races. So I kind of got off the Shikari train. And then in 2020, she started showing a little bit consistency. And I was like, okay, you know what? She's getting older. She's figuring it out. I'm willing to buy the ticket back on the train again. And then beginning of 2021, I was buying first class seats. I was asking the conductor if I could ride in the in the, the front seat because I was so excited the way she was running the regular season. And now we kind of hit a – we got in a little car crash with this train. The train hit a couple cars because she just ran 11-14 on national television. Yeah, yeah. Got smoked by all the Jamaicans. But she – hey – you don't win them all. I was completely wrong in my take on Shakari that she would win this race. I do think she will eventually win an important race, but it looks like it's not in the cards for this year. Maybe 2022 she wins a race. Maybe not. Maybe Jamaicans continue their, their run and they do well in 2022. But I do think eventually the dam will break and she will have like a gold medal moment. I think she will win a gold medal eventually in her career Mm -hmm. but it's looking like it might be happening later than sooner based off Mm -hmm. this performance i yeah and i think long term she needs to figure out what works for her and may i wouldn't be surprised if she keeps the same approach because she's clearly confident what she's doing but i also wouldn't surprise me if if like michael johnson trotted out and said hey like this is not this is not the best way to be in the optimal um, competitive headspace before you go into a race. I just think people overrate sometimes pre-race motivation and back and forth, and underrate just who was ready, who had who was sharper and better on that day. Right? Like Elaine Thompson ran ten fifty four, Fresh no, Price and Jackson ran 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 ten sevens. Like those are ridiculous times and you can trot it back and say, well, if she didn't do this video or she didn't do that tweet, then maybe she'd done better. I think that is a little bit um, under, that underplays just how well the three Jamaicans ran. I mean, you see this all the time in team sports, right? Oh, they were motivated because they had some bullet and board material as if the team wasn't going to try ahead of time. Like they weren't going to try until they found out that the other team is disrespecting them. Of course they were going to try. Of course they were going to do their best. Like they that that wasn't that wasn't it. Now you could say, well, was the difference between being fourth or fifth and being ninth? Well, maybe, maybe. But again, the bigger issue was one, two, three, and one, two, three came to play. They were better. They were sharper. They got the win. And now we'll now we'll see from here. It sure is interesting. But I think if Thompson Hurrah had won this with like a ten seven zero. It's a totally different story coming out than yeah. Thompson Hurrah winning it with a 154 because now we need to use the world w- words, world, and record anytime we talk about Thompson Hurrah from here on out because she put this she she's put this mark in play. And I, wasn't there a little bit of a little bit of con- not controversy, but talk about like some of the Jamaican athletes don't really like each other. I know for, used to train together, but this felt like a moment where Shelly Ann and Sharika were. Un, they didn't care. Like they didn't like. They weren't like uh, jealous of Elaine's win, like of her ten fifty four. I felt like their reaction to getting second to Elaine at the Olympics was a lot stronger than their reaction to getting second to her here. Because I think in the back of the, all three of those Jamaicans' minds, they're like, "We swept again, mm-hmm. and we beat the American that was talking all this shit." So I think. They kind of were like okay with losing to each other in a weird way. You see, Shelly Ann, I mean, she she just she just lost to Elaine Thompson and she doesn't care because she's like, whatever, we went one, two, three. Jamaica, Jamaica, Jamaica. So you see Sharika and Elaine Thompson walking. I mean Sharika and Shelly Ann walking behind uh Shikari. So yeah. Mm-hmm. It was like kind of like a, a team, it was like a country bond national bonding moment between those three. Jamaican women because they're like, hey, we showed up, we went on USA's turf, and we uh, we exposed them and just dominated. So, big ups yeah. to the country of Jamaica, man. They they know well, what they're doing on the women's side right now. 
not so much the men. Uh, they had their run a few years ago with Usain Bolt. Uh, but maybe eventually, a uh, few years, the men will be doing what the, what the women are doing. It's, in, it's incredible, the, that three. I just said it's so solid this whole year. And hopefully we get that four by one record attempt in Switzerland at the at the end of the year because now you have a ten fifty four person on your team, not a ten sixty one. You have a ten fifty four on your team. All right, we have the whole rest of the meet to get to. That was a half. That was a half hour on the hundred. Travis is going to be proud of us. Travis, <laughs> I hope you got some good stuff out of that. Um, I'm looking at the chat. I wanted to do a, like a comment or two on this, but there's just so many of them, and most of them don't like Gordon. So, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you don't like me. Yeah, I don't know. I, there's there's, there, there's right. too much. Uh, <laughs> Gordon out here saying big. Here you go. Uh, no, here. Gordon out here saying big up. So there you go. Someone liked, <laughs> or maybe they're making fun of your choice of words. Uh, they're probably yeah. making fun of my vocabulary. I have really bad vocabulary. They have people, uh, someone in the chats pretending that they're Sharika Jackson. So we got that going on. This is just, this is an all time day for the chat. There you go. <laughs> Let's talk about no laughs. Okay. Hey. Someone said Gordon, shut up. So there you go. You got that one in there too. Do I, how do I shut up? The whole point is to listen to me and talk to you, Kevin. Am I supposed to sit here and not talk the entire time? This is like – Hold on. One more. One more. One more. One more. Uh, Gordon, all caps. Gordon is fine. He's just a bit delusional. That's true. That's true, King Knight. You nailed Gordon. That is 100% true. Listen, hey, who isn't delusional? Gordon was asked to make a pick and he made a pick. I made a pick and I got it wrong too. I just said Shelly Ann. Gordon said she carried. I said Shelly Ann. We were both wrong. I never would have said 1054 was wrong. What do you want him to not make a pick? Come on. Yeah. Well, let me know. I put $100 on Elaine Thompson to win the Olympic gold. So my own money went towards a Jamaican. And I made money off of it. But I want I was to visit here. Jamaica one day. I want to go there. I've been there. So I hope. I've been to. Oh, really? I've been to Jamaica Champs. I've been to the, their high school championship. It's oh, okay. wild. It's it's like a college football game. It was the coolest track meet I've ever been to. Be honest. I'm being honest. I was like, you never see a track meet like this in America. You don't really even see it in Europe. You could argue like European track meets are good. No, like I felt like I was at Alabama versus LSU football game, but it was a it was high school track, which is wild, right? It's uh, high school this. track We're trying to get, feeling of trying to get Alabama. back in the good graces i'm not trying i'm being honest i've said this i went there in 2014 i had a great time it was 14 or 15 i met zarnell hughes zarnell hughes was on a jamaican team that oh funny? that's right that's yeah, right yeah, yeah, little... yeah i met him yeah, when he, he was, was young yeah i remember that all right he's running for that's good. Okay. the purple team it's kingston college a I purple I don't team know. A they purple were a purple team. purple <laughs> Calabar. Everyone was a big Calabar fan. I was. I. I wanted Calabar to win every time because they had a big contingent. Anyway. Yeah. All right. They like you now. Track. That's all it took. That's all it took. They like. They like. Gordon's right. A hundred percent. Uh. Says. <laughs> all right. No Lyles. Okay. Listen. Here's the thing with No Lyles. Um. You watch track as much as we do, and you start to get a sense of things, and you feel like you know a trajectory. And you look at how Lyles was running this year. And then he goes into pre-classic after getting bronze at the Olympics, after winning the trials, after not running near his personal best. And you don't think a possible outcome is him blowing away the field in the last 50 meters and running a 1952, only two 100s off his PR. You do not think that that's going to happen. And yet, Gordon, that is exactly what happens. I don't know what this means long term. But it was just fun to see Lyles back to doing Noah Lyles things. Yeah. I mean, he's back. I was slowly over this entire season thinking his 19.5 from 2019, was it? In July 2019? That's what year it was? Was it When you ran that 1950? Yeah, yeah, yeah 19, the 1950. In Lausanne, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was slowly over time thinking that was an aberration and that maybe no Lyles is just going to be a 19 seven guy. He can always, you know, be in the mix to medal, but he isn't on the verge to being, um, becoming a consistent Ooh, what's he going to do next type guy where, Oh, now he's running 19 four. Oh, now he's in 19 three. He's getting close to bolt, you know, all that stuff. But 
now he found a way to just sandwich that whole like kind of subpar season with another great performance. And now you start want to think you want to start thinking the 2019 version of Lyles is back, where he easily mm-hmm. won worlds. He's now run 195. And now you start wanting to get back on the Lyles train. We all hopped off it in Tokyo. We're like, all right. Maybe this is a hit. Arian Knighton's looking good. He's a young gun. Can he be? Just beat him. You know, Andre DeGrasse obviously winning the, the Olympic title. Maybe t- Lyles' time is over. But then he's like, no, 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 not so fast. And he runs 1952. And our, here's the question for you, Kevin. You just lost yeah. the house betting on Noah <laughs> Lyles. Are you willing to now double down now that he's run 19.5 again for 2022? Get doubling. that house back. You can get your house back, man. Yeah, I'm doubling down. I'm doubling down. I like doubling I like what down. I saw. He had more so than the other sprinters for the US that didn't run well in in Tokyo, the fa- the quote unquote favorites. He had more of a an at least an understanding of of why he was struggling. And there's a good Washington Post article if people don't know what I'm referring to that goes in depth, more depth than I'll go into here. So it, it made a little bit more sense. So I'm back with 19.5 Lyles. I loved it. I love that his brother finished third, Josephus, almost set a PB or set a PB, almost broke 20 seconds. Like beat some, make some big names in this race too. It was a total Lyles situation. Gordon, you can call me a sucker. I'm, I'm doubling You're down. Back in. Lyles, 2022. Uh, is where it's at. He, the last 50 looked really good. Right? Like the last, yeah. like that was the Lyles we know who just, he pours it on at the end. And he kind of runs the last 50 the way Shawnee miller Weibo when she's really clicking in the 200, runs that last 50, almost like a 400 meter with that strength over that last portion of the race and just pushes everybody back. And he talked about the crowd helping him out, you know, 1974 down to 1952. There's just a, such a huge difference between, and I know, the two tenths of a second. Like there's going to be a huge difference, but 1974 puts you with the pack, makes you uh, vulnerable to a loss, and then you go 195 and you're in another category entirely because then you got to go, you know, to that all time list of Michael Johnson, Bolt, Johan Blake. But I was, I did not think he he had this in him. Grant Holloway didn't think he had this in them. He was, uh, <laughs> he said he was wrong. He said it was wrong as hell. In this, so I was glad to be proven wrong back aboard the Lyles train after a, a brief uh, departure. Yeah, you mentioned the the. He said, "Oh, without a crowd, nineteen seven. With a crowd, nineteen five. I do think this whole like we haven't really talked about it much. I mean, we have a little bit, but the whole non normal type of year and year maybe two plus years now, two years of track." may have like just kind of thrown off some of the momentum of some of these athletes, right? Obviously 2020, yeah. you have barely any races. 2021, you're having these races, but it's super cut back, right? There's no crowds. Tokyo, you're quarantining the entire time. It just doesn't yeah. feel normal. And maybe now that they like finally, they've been waiting for the Olympics for so long. Now that they kind of finally done the Olympics and they feel like, okay, we now can hit the reset button. And now the first race back is a race that had fans. Maybe it's just a sense of normalcy for these athletes. And maybe that is why Noah is able to kind of get back to his 2019 form because he kind of feels normal again, right? Like the whole process of waiting for the Olympics, no crowds, quarantine, all that yeah. is over in a way for him. He's like, all right, let's see what my training can <clears throat> well, show. He talked- my training shows 19.5. Well, and he said he had issues. He talked about – this was after the trials, I believe, or after the Olympics. talked about Josephus was like having to motivate him to run earlier in the year at Mount Sac. He's been open with um, taking antidepressant medications and how that impacted his body. Had trouble, he said, getting um, – having continuity with the same person who, who was the masseuse in his legs and because of COVID and just a lot of change and a lot of disruption to the routine. But – when Lyles is having fun, like when you see that he's having fun out there, the 19.5s are, are possible. And hey, listen, when he ran 19.5 last year, people were, and I probably was, was one of the people saying this, next stop, American record, right? He's going to blow through 19, 
32. He just needs the big stage and he'll get it. Maybe that isn't going to happen. Maybe it could, but maybe it's not going to happen. But even if it doesn't, running a bunch of 19 fives, like put up this all, this is the all time list. He's behind Bolt, Blake, Johnson. That's it. That's the list. Not even, not even Johnson has run nineteen five twice. Right. So right? my 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 point being, my point being, he can collect a ton of gold medals if he if he stays in the nineteen if nineteen five is his ceiling. That's fine. And if he runs between nineteen five and nineteen six, I mean, scroll down a little bit there. Has it Walter Dix has run nineteen fifty three, but anybody else and Gatlin's run nineteen fifty seven and Gay's run nineteen. 58, but those are the people who have run under 19.6. So I know easier said than done, but it's not like he has to break the American record for his career to be yeah. a a big success. Success. He can pick up a lot of gold staying in that range. Speaking of uh, a lot of golds, there is one man who may not question, question of the day, is Andre de Grasse the best sprinter in the world today? Today, as we sit right now, combo one and two, it's got to be. It's got to be. Yeah, all due respect. I agree. All due respect to, all due respect to Jacobs of Italy, but you know he won one gold in the hundred, but shut his season down. Doesn't have the two hundred meter ability like Andre de Grasse does. And de Grasse went out here and did this nineteen or sorry nine point seven four. Beats a good field. Another good race for Fred Curley, by the way, nine point seven eight. But Baker, Bromel, Norman, Gatlin, this was a this is a stacked field. Gordon, we talked about it going in. He he handled them. Again, you combine that with his his bronze in in the hundred, his gold in the two hundred. I think if you have if you had to do a combo one two best sprinter, right now it's it's Andre Grass. Yeah, I mean it's kind of weird too seeing Andre de Grasse win. He's the 200 meter champion, and then in the same meet, Noah Lyles is running his 19.5, and makes you think: Would Andre still have won if we had Noah? If they raced, to, like if they would have raced each other in pre, would Noah have won? Would Andre have won? They both kind of are now saying, "Hey, I'm in my best form." But obviously, you go back to when they last raced. De Grasse was in a better form. Yeah, he's found a. De Grasse has been, you know, he's been dealing with some injuries. I know uh, throughout ever since he got that um, was it bronze in 2015 when he tied with Bromel for yep. bronze. Such a wild right, right. situation. He ran well at the 2016 Olympic Games, but since then he he hasn't been able to be the the guy, the dog. I mean, Christian Coleman was at top uh, for a moment there, right? Noah Lyles was doing his thing. Uh, DeGrasse never really has had that moment. I feel like right now, if you had to do a world power ranking. DeGrasse officially is number one. Question mm-hmm. is, how long will that last? Because you know Coleman comes back next year. Fred Curley's yep. not going anywhere. Bromel's going to hopefully get back to his form. And then Noah Lyles just runs 19-5. It's going to be hard to stay up top because that's a that was a spot that one man held for like 10 years, right? And then Coleman mm-hmm. kind of had it. Coleman and Noah Lyles kind of shared it, right? But now I feel like it's not being shared by anyone. I feel like DeGrasse is the king of sprinting right now in the world. Question is, how long will he stay up top? Because there's a lot of people chasing him. You see this photo. Two people in that photo are chasing him in uh, yeah. Bromel and, and, and Fred Curley. Here's the thing, though. It's cool to have the title, but ultimately it doesn't mean anything because it's track. And you just got to prove yourself yet again. And someone could could surprise at a diamond league later on in the year and we'd be talking about them as as well um oh we got super chats gordon you want to talk about the super yeah. chats super we got chat. two of them, i think i think it's just one now nah, there was another one someone sure. wanted us to mention that shikari been off for nine weeks and i like it because the chat was so not it was so jamaica centric so it was good to have somebody just chime in and be like, hey shikari was off for nine weeks she'll be back she'll be fine yeah, this other stupid chat from Stacy. Shakari's personal best is 1072. Shelly won in 1074. Jackson was 1076. Shakari would have very well been in the thick of things. Change coach. Change coach. She shouldn't change coach yet. No, the, the, we, uh, 
this is a blemish, right? This is uh, she got knocked down. She got she got took a loss, took an L, right? Not everyone is going to be Floyd Mayweather and be fifty and zero. She can have a few losses. Um, I think she needs to start addressing her process until she has multiple versions of this type of race. You know, if she comes back and runs like 10, 8 in a Diamond League and wins or gets second, you know, then she kind of feels like yeah. she got her mojo back. But it's a wait and see for Shakari in my mind. So, should we move the podcast to, to Jamaica, Gordon? Like we should. just do on location podcasts? Hey, be in favor of that. I'd be down. I mean, I'd have to bring to my family. Or I'd have to yeah. bring the family with them and just say, hey, we're going to. Well, do you it. don't have a house. You can buy a house in Jamaica with the no allows money. That's true. I need to. I need to borrow the negative two hundred dollars that you made from the Olympics <laughs> to start a new life down there. Uh, someone says I'm endangering my track rep. How did you not think that a fit riled up Jamaican Olympic champ? Is Shakari's PR so vital for the U.S.? Uh, I mean, a lot of people ran fast at the Olympics. Doesn't mean they're going to be able to do the exact same thing a couple weeks later. That's why yeah. I picked. That's why I picked. Shannon Fraser Price. Because listen, if someone didn't run well, they would say, hey, it's because they were coming off the Olympics and they didn't put as much emphasis into this race. That's, that's, I don't know. I've, I've just seen so many disappointing sprint results in my time watching track that I've stopped expecting greatness every time I see sprinters line up. You know, you look even at this regular season, you see some like, that like not that impressive times, and you see you see oh. Elaine Thompson like finished third. Didn't she finish third in a in a race, at, like at one of the Continental Tours or something like that, or second? I'm not sure exactly. Going to Continental but, like, Tours, you're talking Continental yeah, well, Tours. Here? I, I don't, but like I'm just saying, we think that these athletes treat every race like it's the Olympic final, and they don't. I was thinking that the Jamaicans were going to treat Prefontaine like an Olympic final, but clearly they did, and I feel like they had a. A little bit of reason they to, to treat it like Olympic final because of you know a certain yeah. person that was in that race who was talking a lot of shit. So I think we do this. I, I, I bet if Shikari was in that race, oh, there's my take take of the day. If Shikari wasn't in the race, no. Elaine Thompson doesn't run that fast. She runs slower, and she because she doesn't feel the need to. She still wins, but she doesn't run as yeah, fast. I don't think. I, I disagree with that take. But anyway, uh, we do this whole thing where it's like we're trying to extrapolate who cares about this race and the uh, the, the conditions and this. Race. I don't know, man. Track is so unpredictable. It is so unpredictable. You have in a sprint race nine individuals lined up coming from all different directions, and it's just hard to sort out. And there's a lot of races out there where you scratch your head when you look at the result and you try to piece together after the fact, well, why did that happen? And then you come up with a narrative in your head. Then the next race happens and it just goes completely contrary to that narrative that you concocted in your head. Here's one for you. And I know the Eugene track is supposed to be fast, but there weren't whole articles written about it, right? That was supposed to be the Tokyo track. It was so fast. And that's the only reason why they're going fast. And then Elaine Thompson, hurrah, runs seven 100s faster a couple weeks after at the Prefontaine Classic, right? You come up with all this 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 information, data, and then something happens, and then you just move on to the next thing. Uh, one more super chat. Uh, Aaron says, move to Jamaica, but leave Gordon. Okay, but can we bring Travis and Colt, the producers? I guess that would be the, the tricky part. Or would they be working remote? You can do a works. solo podcast? Is that the plan? You're just going to talk It's just to... going to be me in Jamaica wandering around with this microphone, <laughs> and talking track on the with everybody. Yeah, but like, hey, what do you guys think of Elaine Thompson? What do you guys think of Johan Blake? It's just going to be track 24-7. Do you want to talk about a thing, Mo? Yeah, I skipped her, so I apologize. But a thing, Mo, 155 flat. I wanted to see a 154. I thought we would get a 154. I thought we were going to get it after she went through the opening 600 in like yeah. one – what was it? 122? What was she? 122 or something like that? Through, what was her opening 600? One twenty four. One, sorry, one twenty four. Apologies. Yeah. So I was like, "Ooh, one twenty four. One twenty four is a top fifteen all time six hundred meter mark." Please don't. I was ever like, say she's already six hundred meter time on this podcast. I'm just saying. This so is why she's you, going through. This is why you don't get to go to Jamaica. Right here is why you don't get to go to Jamaica. You literally said why? the words. That's an all time six hundred meter mark because nobody runs a six hundred. Come on. There's I know. There's a lot of reasons still. why this was impressive. It wasn't because of the six hundred meter peep or six hundred meter time. No, Continue. but that showed she was – she put herself out there. She went out in 55 seconds. She did. Caitlin she Whitney, did. Right. Um, 
rabbited, a 400 meter runner rabbited. Uh, she put herself out there at 55. She stayed out there going through 600 meters in the top 15 all time mark of 124. <laughs> so she, she set herself up to have a yeah. potential at a world record. Now, clearly, she kind of tightened up in that final 200, final 100, but that's fine. She yeah. was going to win regardless. But I like that she went for it. She didn't, like, she gave herself a chance at a world record. Now, clearly, she's not ready for it, and that's okay. She's 19 years old. But I do think the fact that she's already willing to start experimenting with a record attempts gets me excited for her future because – she had no reason to need to do a race where she just won the Olympic gold. She had a long college season. She doesn't need to go out there and attempt to break a world record, but she, she did. And she screamed, I'm done at the end. Cause clearly she's been tired. <laughs> she's had a long year. Uh, she's happy to be done. She went for it one last go. And I think in man, indoor, she's going to be blasting records in indoor in 2022. But I do think we're going to see a one, at least a 154 in 2022 from a thing, though. At least, at least one. The margin is staggering. Even though we know that she was going to run 155, it just felt automatic based on how easy she had looked the last couple times she had run. When you watch the replay of that race and they cut away and they're in two different shots with about 150 <laughs> to go, it's it's like you're watching two different races with a thing, Mo. Her season has been close to perfect this year. The way they meet, uh, measured out her races, I've talked about it ad nauseum. I'll just say it once again since this is, looks like the last time we'll see her this season. They deserve a lot of credit. The, the people around her, um, coaches, um, advisors, the people, you know, she did a good job measuring her effort out this year and knowing exactly what the goal was in mind every single race. And this was, this was an optimal season for her. You couldn't ask for much more. And again, yeah, this is another race where we didn't think a world record would be discussed, but you're going to have to in the coming years. Whitney went out in 54. Mo was kind of following her, but not really, Like she wasn't, it's not like she was latched onto her. So I, I wonder if there was a little bit more time to be gained there. And maybe she, she went out just a little bit too quick but if you want to run 154 153 there's not much room for error it's not as if you're going to go you you could go out in 57 right and then you're going to need to even split it coming back and if you do the whole you know the two second differential thing then you're going to need to go out you know right around you know 55 56 to make that happen if you're looking for sub 155 and yeah, I give her credit. She could have just sat with the pack and then kicked away over the last 200. But she looked at this as an opportunity to, to get a PR, and she did. She got another American record. Consistency at 155 is is a scary thing if you're another 800-meter runner in the world going against the thing, Mo. All right. Not to change the subject on a thing, Mo, but we, we, she's, we obviously had – but look who got second, Kate Grace. Hey, Grace got yeah. second in a field that basically was the Olympic final. Is Kate Grace the second best 800 meter runner in the world right now? <laughs> no, we did this game last time. I said if she beats the Pigmo, then I would elevate her um, up there. Yeah, she's been great. She's been she's been absolutely phenomenal post post trials. I mean, how many times has she run 157 now? Was this her third or fourth 157 since? I think it's her fourth trials? or fifth. Yeah. And then, and then she also had that mile win as well. She's been she's been terrific. Rogers ran and Gould ran, you know, pretty solid one fifty seven, one fifty eight. What we're seeing with the thing Mo is sort of the Caster Semenya effect of just one person so far out that in certain races the rest of the field is able to get the benefit because they tow the race along. But in other races, it just becomes it's bifurcated and there's two two separate races, and then you have everybody just racing for second in the same way they'd race for first. They're lining up and trying to get on each other's shoulders and then kick the last, the last hundred. And that's something to watch next year going into the early diamond league events. If a thing Mo does them, it's just how does, how does the field react to her level of dominance? Do they try to go with her? Cause Ricky kind of tried a bit and then Ricky got left and ran 
too flat and finish eighth. It's a cautionary tale if you want to go with a Figmo. You know what I'm just going to say right now? Every 800 meter runner in the world, not in the world, every 800 meter runner in the US are going to become huge Kate Grace fans this summer. Oh, that's right. Or this yeah, fall. Because yeah. Kate Grace is looking like she is on the path to be one of the favorites to win the Diamond League 800 meter final, which is in September. Because we know a thing Mo is not going to be there. Uh, Kate Grace has shown that she can beat Hodgkinson. She can show she can beat Gould. She's shown she can beat all these other great 800 meter runners. If Kate Grace goes in to the Diamond League final in September and wins, she gets a bye to the 2022 World Championships, which is going to be really important because we already know someone else has a bye. Not really a bye, but a bye by just being better than everyone in the thing, Mo. So if Kate Grace can get that bye, that means that Mo, I mean, that means basically four people get to go to Worlds in 2022, with Kate Grace being one of them. And uh, it definitely takes the pressure off. So even Raven Rogers, for that matter, is in that running to get that bye. So Rogers, Kate Grace, maybe Ajay Wilson, pro- pro- probably not. But Rogers and Kate Grace have a lot to run for in September to get a Diamond League bye because of Thing Mo's in their country. Do you know who they might be bigger fans of? Who? Wes Felix. A Thing Mo's agent to try to convince her to do this race. <laughs> because it's great to have four spots, but you also want a Thing Mo not to be one of the ones that you have to still go against. Yeah, that's uh, true. Get a Thing Mo to do it. Yeah. But you don't have to get it by yourself. Let's... Someone else can get it for you. Yeah. I'm looking at the 800 standings here. They must not have been updated on the Diamond League site. Because right now, Kate Grace is in first with 20 points. Matoya Gold is second with 19. But Thing Mo is not even... Oh, wait. Was that not a Diamond League 800? Maybe not. I don't know. That may not have been a Diamond League 800. It might have been in the Diamond League, but not of the Diamond League. Which is really always fun to... <laughs> it wasn't. Not it was not... Of. Okay, it, it wasn't. So yeah, she has she has zero points. It was Sands Diamond there. So I guess there's Lausanne, Paris, and that's it. That's left, and she would probably not be able to accrue. Okay, if Kate point. Grace wins, so, if Kate Grace, if Kate that. Grace wins, scratch the, all that. If Kate Grace wins the Diamond League final, can you then put her second in the world? In the world or in the U.S.? In the world. I've been trying to get Kate Grace be crown second best 800 meter runner in the world that's my mission okay obviously i think so those number she, one she had run 156 if he runs 156 and and wins an i'm league final i will move her up to number two How about that all time. now number yeah. two in the world yeah. this year okay number two in Got history it. of anybody who ever has ever existed yeah, yeah. so that's too bad about the diamond league uh, situation hmm. there so the standings are then we can talk about school, let's move on school. next Hold on. People want to know the top eight of the 800 Diamond League. No, just kidding. Let's go. No, let's, let's go on to the next topic. Nobody wants What's to the know next topic? The next topic is – my voice cracked. Men's mile. Uh, Jacob Inge- – Jakob Ingebrigtsen. Go ahead, Gordon. You called this one. They don't remember when you I get did. it right. They don't remember when you get it right. Uh, we did have a someone email us. Actually, before we talk about – I want to bring up the email. Uh, hold on. Let me read. Well, don't put, don't post their email address. I'm not going to post the email address. I'm going to f- just read it. Uh, okay. So the, the guy, Tim, emailed us with the headline 347.32. He dressed it to you, Kevin. He said, I've listened to nearly three hours of pre-classic preview from your various pods. And as far as I can tell, you never mentioned 347.32. True track fans will instantly be familiar with that mark as it is the fastest time ever run on U.S. soil by Suleiman in 2014. Um, and they go... But yeah, I basically, don't care. I don't care about soil records. Do not but that's what Jakob Ingebrigtsen did. He he broke the soil record, which is a you know, yeah. not only was it a U.S. soil record, but it was a an Oregon soil record. It was a Eugene soil record. It was Lane County uh, soil record. Lane County soil record. Uh, but three forty seven is no joke. Give all ups to Stuart McSwain, who made yep. it honest yep. after the pacer dropped off. We could kind of tell that Timothy Cherry had no desire to run fast in this race. He's like, I don't want to do that. I have no, I don't want to try to run 347. I just want to try to win a, 
mm, a tactical, tactical race, race. And yeah. that's what Timothy Chariot did in third. But Ingebrigtsen looks so sm- – when he saw McSwain take it out after the rabbit went off and yeah. Ingebrigtsen just like chilling on him the entire time, you just yeah. knew the inevitable was about to happen when Jakob make a move in the final 300. But Jakob, man, he looked good. He's young. Can't even go to the Wild Duck to drink after that victory because he's not 21 yet. Um, but my thought that the dam has been broken, that the chariot like wall that no one was ever going to beat him in a 1500 or mile ever again, yeah, was smashed by Jakob at the Olympic final. And now we're going to just see greatness go on for a few years. I don't see he had- Jakob losing another race that matters until 2025. I'm still not there yet, but this was a good run. And he he was he had a good assist there for McSwain because McSwain basically served as a secondary rabbit for him. Cherio did what I thought he might do, and I don't know the motivation behind it, but he basically was shadowing Jakob, saying, well, I'm not going to go out there. I'm not going to be like McSwain. I'm going to stay back. The problem is Ingebrigtsen basically turned into the 2019 version of Timothy Chariot himself. So Chariot got out charioted by Ingebrigtsen here and just put the gas down and did not let go and showed no sign of letting up at all. We talked about 347, actually even 346 or 345 being a possibility. So I, the time did not surprise me. Did it surprise you? No, it didn't surprise me. Um, and I'm excited for more. I he's, he's born in 2000, man. The guy was born. He has yet to turn 21. He turns 21 in less than a month. September 19th is his birthday. 2000, baby. That's crazy. And he's running 347. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm excited for him to go start climbing up this all-time leaderboard in both the mile and in the 1500. You see in the mile now, he's ninth all-time right behind Alan Webb, who's mm-hmm. eighth at 346.91. I think next year, he probably runs 346. The year after that, he probably has like a three, maybe one 345. And then we start having these type of world record attempts the way Chep the guy has been doing that with all of his and then running stuff. I think we start seeing some Jakob Ingebrigtsen led record attempts in the next few years. Mm-hmm. I'm not giving up on Chariot yet. I'll just say that, but Jakob's yeah. been, it's been sensational there. Uh, you had Kwamoy of Kenya in fourth, Oliver Hor fifth, Jake Hayward sixth, and then Central was down there in ninth. 353 surprised me a bit just because I, you know, he ran the, Three, three forty nine, in that in that tune up race. So it surprised me that, I guess it just surprised me the race wasn't fat. That second group wasn't as quick. I expected there to be a bit more three fifty low, three forty high guys in this. Do you see uh, Centro ever getting back to being the best in the U.S.? Like, do you think it's this performance maybe adds more <clears throat> reasoning? Think that the Torch has officially been passed to Cole Hawker. I'm just still, I'm still waiting and see on that. I mean, I think that still waiting to see. when you're, when you're, when your best accomplishment is Olympic gold, and then so someone says, "Well, can you get back to his best?" Is basically saying, "Well, can you win another gold medal?" That's a tough ask. Especially well, they, no, I'm not saying best, but yeah. Could he win the U.S. trials next year? Yes, he could win the U.S. trials next year. Anybody who's okay. saying that is being overly reactive to a couple races. Hawker outkicked him, which is great, but Central's been outkicked before. Uh, I'm not. I thought his, the second half of the season was impressive. People were writing obituaries for Centro in the first half for whatever yeah. reason, based off of tune-up 800s. So no, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say it's. It's it's impossible. I think the fact that we were even talking about him then as a metal threat later on the season just showed you how good the second half of his season was. Hawker's a big talent, obviously, but is there somebody besides Hawker in the U.S. who you think, oh, for sure, that guy can beat Centro next year? I don't. That's not a very long list of people to me. No, no, yeah, agreed. Man, ten oh eight. We've been going for. 70 minutes and we still have yet to talk about like half of the races <laughs> what have we done here the shikari factor I'm... turning this pot into like half of only talking about one race no one Men's, has anything else um, to do today right 
Yeah, no, yeah. It's, fr- it's, mo- it's Monday. It's women's Friday. two mile. It's Friday. It's women's two mile. Happened on Friday night. It was the event that people weren't really talking about because obviously we're talking about thinking about Hassan's 5K world record attempt. But we got a result that just brought a huge smile to my face with Francine and Saba running the second fastest two mile all time, nine flat. And I know the two miles not run that often, but nine flat for a two mile, whether it's run often or not, is an incredible mark. It's back to back 430s. It makes you think, like, what could have happened if Nian Samba was in the 5K final, right? Because she got DQ'd, weirdly yeah. DQ'd. But she she beat Gaudet and Obiri, Klosterhofen. Like, it wasn't like a weak field. Beating no, Gaudet and Obiri is legit. It makes you wish that she made that 5K final. Because clearly the 10K might have been a little too much for her to handle the, the longer distance. But Nian Samba running nine flat, it's incredible. Nian Samba, as for those who don't know, she's been banned from the 800 because World Athletics read a, a research paper that turned out to mislead. It turns out it was a misleading research paper, and they're, they banned her from the 800. And now she's out there running world leads in the two mile as a big kind of F you to the people who says you're not allowed to compete in this event. I think – it makes sense that if you're really good in the 800 and you're really good in the 10K, you're going to be a pretty good two-miler. But to actually see it and to beat people like Gade and Obiri, who just won medals in Tokyo, is incredible. I thought this was – she hung around, and I thought, okay, the longer she hangs around, the better because she's got just so much speed. But I would think she'd be better in the you know more tactical type of race. And maybe she would be even – better in that sort of effort but a nine flat off of a rabbited pace is is mighty impressive for for Nian Saba so yeah this was a surprise to me because I thought a good result for her would be finishing third or fourth even after what she did in Tokyo but to beat both those women in the margin with which she did it I mean she really poured it on there I don't know if we have the, the splits but she really crushed it over the last two laps of this race and just being able to adjust mid-career to the longer stuff. Now, it's a bummer for her that the 3K slash two-mile is not on the championship program. So she's either got a steeple, if she wants to do that distance, or run the five, which is what she did in Tokyo before she got... World indoors. DQ'd. Yeah, you're right. World indoors. 3K world indoors. Sure. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question, Kevin. and You probably are going to answer, answer it very... Uh bureaucratically or what's where i don't know what the word is uh, you're gonna ask here hold on hold on hold on hold on i'm gonna guess gordon's gordon's question here are they gonna now extend the prohibited event list up to the two mile because of this race yeah up to the two mile and down to the 200 right they're gonna be like oh we just got new research that says you now can't do the 200 to the two mile we don't know what just happened don't look at what just the results we saw but we now need to change it because the new science is here. Um, but yeah, what do you think they're going to... Do you think World Athletics is going to have any move here from what we're seeing from Christine and Boma and yeah. Nian Samba here in the two mile? I think... I, mean, I, I don't think they would extend it just to the 3K unless they're really are interested about World Indoors. I think if they extended it, they would have to go up to the 5K. Don't you think? That would be a little weird to just to extend yeah. it. To, to prohibit people in the in the three k or the the two mile, and then I think they're gonna have to answer these questions because, as you mentioned, that the the paper that they relied on for a lot of this information, then they just retracted it, which is becoming a big issue now. People are wondering, well, are, is, can does Semenya have a case now? Are they gonna re reopen this? Um, I know you wanted to talk about that on a later pod in more depth. Short answer: No. On this one result, I don't think on this one result they will. I think if she at if she got gold in the five k at Tokyo, then I think there would have been strong discussions because they've said that themselves. They said we're leaving this possibility open. If someone demonstrates success in this event, then that's uh, an inclination or that's that's evidence that we need to revise the list of prohibited events. So I don't think I don't think it would be out of what they've already said. 
But based off so of World Athletic- two mile, I don't think so. It's kind of hilarious what we just said there. So basically saying if you try if you win, you're not allowed to compete. But if you lose, you can compete. Like right. you're only allowed yeah. to compete yeah. in events that you don't win. That's basically what you're there what you're kind of extrapolating. Like if you can just get fifth and fourth in these events, we're gonna be cool. But if you win it, no, we're not gonna be cool. You know? And again, well, going black- Sama didn't go out didn't go out there and run eight flat. She ran nine flat. Okay. She ran a time that some women can aspire to run. It's not a crazy world, run, crazy yeah. time that no women will ever be able to touch. We're about to see a, eventually a woman run a sub 14 5K, right? That's that's gonna happen in our lifetime yeah. in the next five years. We're gonna see that. Women get faster. They and then there's some women who are just, you know. Better than others, and it's Nian Saba deserves to be running in track and field competitions. And I am thrilled that she ran nine flat here because her livelihood was taken away from her, and now she's able to get back to having a livelihood and a one that's filled with success, winning the two mile in, at the pre classic. Very awesome. Big ups. Mm-hmm. So that's all I got to say about that. We can talk. I do want to talk more about that whole Castro Semenya. I put out a tweet that some people reacted to. I do want to talk about that, but Brie Fontaine just was so big that we can save those topics for another pod. So mm-hmm. stay tuned. You mentioned a sub, you mentioned a sub fifteen, sub fourteen, excuse me, five k. We almost. I mean, I thought we were going to see one on Friday night with Safan Hassan. She was on pace <clears throat> to run about fourteen ten through three k, and then she fell off and did not get the the world record. So. I guess even Safan Hassan is allowed to have an, an off race. Did you – I guess how far into this thing did you think she still had a shot? Because I, when she was running 250 a K, I'm thinking, all right, 14-10 pace, and then she's going to do a crazy close. This is setting up perfectly. But then the pace just started drifting up and up and up from there. Yeah, I was on board through like halfway. So it's like 2.5K. And then that's when I started realizing, ah, oh, she's not she's not staying it. Because she would have just been able to click it consistently through 4K. And then that final K, you're just going for broke. But she her click her clicks were good through 1K, through 2K. But when she hit 3K and 4K, they were getting slower and slower. And I was like, all right, it's, it's over. But um, hey, that's why you go for these attempts. Every time you go for an attempt, it doesn't have to always work, right? You can have mm-hmm. failed attempts, and this is one for failed attempts, but she's good enough that she'll have future opportunities down the line. Um, not sure where, if there's another 5K on the schedule. I mean, there's the Diamond League final 5K, but that's not going to count because it's on an outdoor track, like weird road track. So I'm not sure what else she yeah. has. Yeah. I think she said previously, I don't know if it's still the plan, but she wanted to run, go for the 10K world record, I think, in Brussels. So she wants to get her record back in the 10K. Okay. I see her, and I'm just like, do you want a break? You've been running a lot. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you don't she want looks to tired. Like the, the, the 10K record will be there next time. I just, her hamstrings, like I feel bad for them. She's just had, she ran <laughs> 24,500 meters in Tokyo and then goes, and goes for the record here. It's not as if she jumped in an off distance race or ran a tactical 5,000. Like she was clicking it off and those marks are going to be there next year. I don't think anybody's going to lower them in the interim. And if they do, it'll just be by a tiny little bit. Don't get me wrong. I want to see it run. I want to see it run. This is great. And this is a lot of fun. And I give her credit for continuing to go after it. But I just, part of me thinks, man, she's got to be really tired, right? Do you think there's any race or achievement, like a triple or like time, whatever, at a certain distance that someone could run where it's just so impressive to the world and to themselves that as soon as they cross that finish line, they just like, I'm never running again. I have done <laughs> it all. I am like, I am just wa- never running, no more jogs, no nothing. I am 100% done. Like, I don't know. I mean, you could argue like maybe Ilya Kipchoge breaking two in the marathon. Could be yeah. that moment, but clearly it wasn't because he, he kept going and he's still Go, yeah. running, going on to win Olympic golds. Um, but I got to think, there's just something that you could do that's just so impressive. Where it's like, 
running is done. I've done it. I've completed the yeah. run. Like it's it's over. <laughs> Obviously, this doesn't happen because these are elite athletes and they don't have that mindset. Yeah. But if I ever went out and like hit a PB that I've always wanted, I could see myself convincing myself, yep, time to just hang it up. I'm done. Never running again. Well, they would have – I mean, Hassan, if she had done the triple, I don't think she would have retired, but that would have been no. pretty close to it. You have nobody in the world who can compete with me in a 1,500, a 5,000, and a 10,000 when they all were running fresh. Yeah. And I was – like me tired is better than all of you at three <laughs> different distances. Yeah. I do agree with you on the – the Kipchoge one. If he had just taken off of his taken off his alpha flies and left him off the finish line and walked off, but like I've done it all, I wouldn't have blamed him. And started I'd started been, eating cake and cheeseburgers. <laughs> I'd have been sad. I'd have been sad because I want to see him do it, and I'm glad that we get to see him him run still. But I would have totally understood. Of hey, I've accomplished everything I can accomplish. Um, you know, do women's women's fifteen here? Another blowout. This is interesting. Low key, like women's eight blowout, women's fifteen blowout, women's two mile blowout. Obviously, Hassan's five k was designed to be a time trial, but that was a blowout as well too. But Faith Kipyegon just ran away from everybody again. I thought the world record might be in play, but she still ran really fast time here, um, backing up her Olympic title three fifty three twenty three won by over six seconds. Gordon, this was one of those like. Oh, this race is fast, but it's like, nah, the race wasn't fast. It was just one person in the race was really fast. Yeah, I mean, Kipiegon is sh- like, her her win over Monaco just becomes more and more impressive, right? Or beating um, Safana San. Obviously yeah. followed up with beating her again at the Olympics. But now this like time trial type race for her, she just looked so like on a different planet as the rest of the field it was it was kind of like weird it's like whoa like how can you be that much better than everyone else like this doesn't make sense and i think we're starting to see that just as a trend in our sport like you mentioned we see people who are just like so much better than the rest of the field because of whatever reason they're just happen to be in a certain timeline that's different from everyone else where their peak is just like yeah different from everyone else's. Uh, but what I want is I want to kind of combine Faith Kipiegon's performance with a little bit of Jakob Ingebrigtsen and not to bring up controversial athletes, but it kind of reminds me of when Kiprop and Debaba were running fast in their 1500s respectively, and they were chasing world records. I think we might be kind of seeing something similar to that with Kipiegon and, and Jakob. With they're both kind of entering their prime. Jakob, you could say, is still pre-prime. But every time Faith yeah. Kipiegan steps on that track, we're going to be thinking, do we see 349? That's what we're going to be thinking. Well, and here's the situation now on the women's side of things. You have now the 100 and 200 records are under threat. 400 is still out there. 800, 15 is under threat. The 5 and the 10, if they get together the right field – it's definitely possible because they were broken this year. Four minute hurdles is going down every every time Muhammad and McLaughlin get together. Women's high hurdles, Kenny Harrison's 12 2. Well, Camacho Quinn got pretty close this year. Women's steeples a little bit out there. Then he could get into, into the field events as well, too. But you got a situation where in any given meet, you have people who are world record capable. Yeah. In. In, in at least Everybody. one of these women's races. Cause, well, because the chance of a Diamond League happening that like doesn't have either Thompson Hurrah, a thing Mo, Faith Kipiegon, Safan Hassan, Muhammad, McLaughlin, uh, Kenny Harrison, or Camacho Quinn, like you figure like at least one of them is going to be at these at one of these meets. So I, it's it's really interesting right now. The women's side of things is really interesting from a historical perspective. Yeah, agreed. Anything else we have? Uh, men's two mile. So I said the over. What's that? This, me- this meet was so crazy. There's so much happening. Yeah. It's like the Olympics uh, all packed in one day. It's basically what it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Men's men's two mile. I set the over under at which lane Paul Chalima would finish in at two point five. I believe he was in two at the finish line. Okay. Um, 
we, we, we could pull up a photo of that to, to double check and confirm. But Chapter Guy gets the win. The guy that you are surprised is a kicker continues to kick really well. This looked a lot yep. like that Tokyo 5,000, even though the distance was shorter, where he took command going into the bell and then and then held everybody off. But this was a good a good run all around with with the top dogs really showing up there and Borrega edging Chalimo for for second place. But what did you think of uh, uh, Chapter Guy closing speed on display again? Yeah, you know he's showing more and more his closing speed. I want to see Chepta guy in a fifteen hundred. I think that'll be exciting <laughs> to see what he can do. We saw Mo Farah kind of flirt with that a couple times in Monaco. He ran three twenty eight, I think, once. But I'd love to see Chepta guy in a fifteen hundred. Chepta guy just he's continue, continuing to be the man. Like he's pretending to be yep. that guy. We kind of talk about who can be the next Mo Farah when the dominant. I mean. The Farah and Bolt era was like perfect. It overlapped, right? So you just had a dominant person in the shorts and a dominant person in the long distance. Uh, yeah. We've been kind of searching for the next Bolt. We're not sure if we have it yet. We're still kind of figuring that out. And we're now searching for like the next Mo Farah. Chepta guy, you could argue, is slowly becoming that guy. Obviously, he has that loss in the 10K to um, to Borrega. He lost to Borrega, right? Borrega. The 10K. Yep. yep. Yeah. But he showed up, still won the five, comes here, wins this two mile against both Borrega and Chalimo in this. So if Ch- Chapter I can keep, stay consistent, he's going to be, maybe he won't be perfect and constantly win gold, gold, gold. But I think yeah. Chapter Guy's floor in every world championship is going to be bronze. Like I feel like that's just going to be his floor in every global final he's in is bronze. I mean, he's got this opportunity now with the five and the ten over the next couple of years to rack up a bunch, a bunch of medals and get in there in the in the bolt or sorry not the bolt conversation the uh, the Farah conversation and and he has a world records of Bekele too so we're still early days of Chepta guy but a lot of potential there for sure one last race women's steeple women's steeple Gordon we saw an American record from Courtney Frerichs she finished. Runner up in this race, Nora Jurtu got the win, eight fifty three. But Frerichs eight fifty seven point seven seven. It was interesting because you know men knocking on the door of sub eight, women in the United States knocking on the door of sub nine, and Frerichs the first person to do it and smashes through, breaks her own American record. What do you think? Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm. We don't. I don't think we have Travis anymore. So I'm trying to bring up a head to head. Um. 3,000 meter steeplechase. I think the thing I get out of this race right away, Courtney Ferrex breaks the American record again, right? And when you think of the US and steepling, the yeah. first name that typically comes to your mind is Emma Coburn, right? You're like, Emma Coburn, she's the yeah. queen of the steeple in the US. And the question now is, is Courtney Ferrex? The actual queen? And the reason why it seems so weird to say that is I just pulled up head to head. We don't have Travis on graphics, but head to head, they've raced 20 times against each other. How many times do you think Courtney Ferrex has beaten Emma Coburn out of the 20 times? Two. Damn. You're right. Two. I pulled it up. Two. I pulled it up. I only only have them competing. I have them competing 18 times in the steeple, and it's 16 to 2, Cobra. That's what I have. Oh, I have it 20 times, so 2 to 18. Yeah. Um, but obviously, Coburn has found a way to always win at the USA Championships. Courtney's always getting second or third, depending on whatever the situation is. Yeah. And But she, Coburn has all these head-to-head wins against her, even dating back all the way to college. But when it comes to like... Fast marks, it's Courtney Frerichs. I mean, 857 and, eight, and nine flat, no joke. Yeah. Emma Coburn's not doing that. Are we slowly but surely going to see Courtney Frerichs? I mean, I feel like Courtney can't do anything. I just think Kemp Coburn has beaten Frerichs so many times that even if Frerichs goes on to win a gold medal, it's just, I mean, Coburn has a gold. So I don't know. It's a weird situation. I think, I think you have the factor of three medals versus two and one of those medals being gold is the reason why the or and the head to head right i I, yeah. I think you outlined it now if Frerichs is able to 
even up the medal count and even get a gold, then the conversation gets really interesting. But it's tough to measure, and this is something that track fans will argue about, but it's tough to measure, okay, you have the better, two better times, but we've dominated head to head. I think most people are going to go lean towards the head to head there. But 857, barrier breaking performance there for Frerix. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, how old is Courtney Frerix? She's 28. So she still has maybe a few more years of a prime. I mean, if she's still, I mean, typically prime is 22 to 26, but obviously there's outliers who are able to extend it to like 32. So I think she can still be relevant in these next three championships, you know, through to Paris. But I agree. She needs to win a couple more medals to kind of have more than Coburn. And she needs to beat Coburn at a USA's. Like Coburn has just dominated the US championship. Just just shows up and wins. That's like it's Coburn and a win. But Frerix, mm-hmm. man, she can, can run another sub nine later yeah. this year, maybe at a, in a Diamond League final, then run another sub a couple more sub nine, just be consistently running nine flat. That's gonna be hard to to beat. Uh, consistency is always the hardest thing to beat. If you're consistent, you typically are always finishing in the medal. So um, I just start. I just started thinking about it. I always thought Coburn Women's Steeple U.S. That's just what I always thought. But now I'm like, wait a minute. Two, two fastest marks ever run are by Courtney Ferrix, and maybe maybe Courtney should be it. Like, I don't know. Like, Courtney did break (laughs) Coburn's NCAA uh, record. She broke Coburn's American record. I don't know. It just makes you think. I guess it's how important is time. How important is time? That's the existential question, Gordon, that we've all tried to seek out answers to. But we'll discuss that more. Um, I saw Abigail in the chat was asking about Tiana Daniels. We're going to talk about Tiana Daniels on Wednesday. We're going to get to – We'll do like pre classic recap part two on Wednesday. We're gonna keep <laughs> going. Like there's uh there's still a lot to talk about. Um thanks everybody in the chat. They have not calmed yeah. down in the chat. I'd say you got people on your side for a little bit by saying how much you like the boys and girls champs in in Jamaica. I don't know if they're still there because people have really high standards. They want you to like make the exact correct pick all of the time, but that pick needs to correspond with their pick. Otherwise, they get upset. And just to be clear, we're American, but we don't really have a rooting interest. I know it's hard for people to believe, right? We're interested in stories and following people, but there's no there's no rule book here that says because we're American that we're rooting for Americans. So people going in and say, ha, how do you guys feel now? I think we both feel fine. Hey, because we talk about track. Doesn't I'm just excited to watch. The, I'm just excited to watch them race again. I think Shakari versus Jamaicans should keep keep happening. And if the Jamaicans keep winning, that make that's even awesome. That's even more of a storyline. Whoa, they just keep on destroying Shakari's hopes and dreams. And mm-hmm. maybe we'll see. But right. hey, hopefully we get to see him again in the Diamond League final. Get part two. Get chaos. So yeah. You know, I have, no gonna, I have no idea if that's going to I have no idea if that's going to happen. Like for for the record, I have no idea if we're, we're going to get this again. Even if we don't get it for this year, it's still going to be obviously a talking point um, for next year. I mean, there's no way it, it doesn't. So anyway, we'll leave it there. We'll be back Wednesday. So Wednesday, uh, 9 a.m. Central Time start. I don't know based on people's time zones what time it is, but you figure it out. It's 9 a.m. Central. Uh, thanks to Travis for producing thanks to colt for producing thanks everybody who tuned in flowtrack podcast at gmail.com if you want to uh write us in a, a nice note or recommendations for what gordon should talk about uh, or think about or predict just any of that uh we'll talk to you guys next time